Welcome to the Manhattan Institute's event on the future of megacities. I'm Michael Hendricks, Director of State and Local Policy here at the Manhattan Institute. Uh, COVID-19 has been challenging the growth of modern megacities. Uh, we're focused on these places of 10 million or more people from New York to London, from Mumbai to Sao Paulo, because they're big, they're influential, and they've been ground zero for COVID-19. So we're going to discuss today what is the future of these large superstar cities, um, particularly after the pandemic ends, and uh, what lessons do they have to offer, not only for the for the residents and leaders of these cities, but for the rest of the rest of the world, uh, because we're really making our urban future today. Now, to uh, lead us in this conversation, we're joined by some incredible thinkers. Uh, first off, uh, Richard Florida, a professor at uh, University of Toronto School of Cities and the Rotman School of Management and a distinguished fellow at NYU Shack School of Real Estate. He's a, a prolific writer, thinker, journalist, speaker. He's penned several global bestsellers, including The Rise of the Creative Class and uh, The Next Urban Crisis here. Uh, he's the co-founder of the Must Read City Lab and the founder of the Creative Class Group. Uh, we're also joined by Ed Glazer, the Fred and Eleanor Glimp Professor of Economics at Harvard University, as well as a senior fellow at the Manhattan Institute and a contributing editor at our City Journal. He's published countless papers on cities, economic growth, law and economics, as well as the book, Triumph of the City. And we're also joined by Jeanette Sadiq Khan, one of the world's foremost authorities on transportation and urban transformation. Uh, she served as New York City's transportation commissioner under Mayor Michael Bloomberg, and is the founding principal of Bloomberg Associate. She chairs the National Association of Transportation Officials and is the author of Street Fight, Handbook for an Urban Revolution. Uh, all of these are tremendous books and tremendous thinkers here. Thank you so much for joining us. Now let's dive right in. This is uh, not the first time the plague has come for our biggest cities and it won't be the last. Each time uh, cities have bounced back from these moments of crisis. Is this time different? Uh, why are we not? First to you, Richard, and then to Jeanette and Ned. Well, I think it's pretty clear that cities have survived far worse. Um, Ed knows this a lot because he studied the history even deeper than I have, but uh, we can look in the way, way distant past and see some blips. But in modern days and going back a long way, uh, it's been hard for a pandemic about an infectious disease to uproot a city. And one thing I will add, Michael, is, you know, I was born during a pandemic. No one told me about it. Most of my aunts and uncles, and I come from a large Italian American family, most of my aunts and uncles, uh, a couple of dozen of them, were born or toddlers during the Spanish flu, never mentioned. We, we covered in urbanism, role of crises, great wars, other disasters, and, and pandemics typically have not derailed uh, the, the progress of urbanization. That said, I do think this time is different. Uh, I do think this time is different because, because although we are concentrating more than ever before, if you look at world historical, more people live in urban areas, the effects of clustering, our economies are greatly clustered, our technologies do enable some decentralization. And I guess I would say it this way. I actually expect less change in what we would call our macro geography. Uh, yes, there will be the rise. Well, Austin's been rising for most of my adult life. So there'll be the rise of, of second cities and great hubs like Austin and others. Rich people will move to the sun in Miami to avoid taxes. I don't think we're going to see London and New York and megacities decline in their real influence in the world stage. I do think in the micro geography, in the way we spread ourselves across urban areas, in the relative role of an urban center versus a suburb versus an exurb versus a rural fringe area, there will be some accommodation. And I think the big change is not so much in the geography of residence, which we've seen a lot of speculation. The big change will be in the geography of how we work. Fascinating. Jenna, is this time different? Well, you know, I mean, people have been talking about the death of cities forever. And, you know, Richard and Ed know all about that. You know, there have been hundreds of articles just this year alone asking if the death of the city is, is you know, upon us. But, you know, uh, COVID didn't create this genre. You know, Jane Jacobs was already turning the phrase 60 years ago, you know, when she titled her famous book, The Death and Life of Great American Cities. And, when you think about it, our cities have really been shaped by pandemics and natural disasters. 
and the social dislocations that they've you know, endured. And New York City alone has weathered you know, economic crises and blackouts and 9-11 and Sandy. We lost a million residents in the 1970s. And you know, each time, you know, these doomsayers predict the death of New York and the death of cities, you know, always questioning whether it's gonna come back. Will they ever wanna live in cities? Will they ever live in skyscrapers? Will they ever take transit? You know, and every time, you know, New York comes back stronger and more resilient. And, you know, Richard mentioned the influenza pandemic, you know, and there was, you know, a similar impact on transit. When you had ridership then plunge by 17 million people in the fall of 1918, and the very next year, ridership was up 100 million, you know. So, you know, when you're in a head tuck position, the only thing you see is the floor. And I think you're seeing a lot of that right now. And we're seeing a lot of versions of the same argument, you know, come out. Cities are dangerous, they're vectors for, you know, infection. And in fact, the research shows none of that, you know, transit played no significant role in that. But I don't, I think that the biggest threat to cities is not the coronavirus. I really think the biggest threat to cities is fear itself. And we can't be so busy fretting about how terrible everything is that we forget to plan the, the kind of future that we really do want, the, the life, of great cities. Mm. Ed, you've written about the triumph of cities. Should we be wondering about the survival of cities? Not really. Uh, I, I share Richard and Jeanette's view that cities are astonishingly resilient, but there are three ways in which this current pandemic is different. First, we have evolved our urban economies into a form in which they are maximally vulnerable to an airborne pandemic. If you think about the subsistence agriculture that marked uh, medieval Europe, uh, the plague was, was a demographic disaster. It was a human tragedy on a grand scale, but the, the two thirds of the population that were left, they were richer, right? Because medieval, medieval wealth was determined by land per capita. Even during the industrial age, uh, the pandemic, for example, the 1919 influenza epidemic didn't fundamentally challenge the economic model. You could still ship mass produced goods and not fear that those goods were going to, were going to kill you. But when your livelihood depends on serving a latte with a smile, when that smile turns into a source of peril rather than pleasure, right, those jobs disappear in a heartbeat. And we have not seen, no prior pandemic had an economic uh, dislocation that was on this level. That does not mean that we won't come back from it. Um, in some sense, the level of economic carnage only makes the case that it is more vital than ever that we make the health investments needed to make sure that this never happens again, but it is different. The second thing that is different, but I think far less important, is our ability to zoom our way to work. It's less important because this, this relates to a very elite stratum of the population, right? 70% of people with advanced degrees during May of 2020 were telecommuting. Only 5% of high school dropouts were telecommuting. This is not a solution for ordinary, ordinary people. Um, secondly, whether or not we can be as creative and interactive online as we can uh, in real life, it's just much less fun, right? And that is both about, you know, Richard's point about the enduring appeal of cities as places uh, of pleasure, as places of consumption, but it's also about the workplace being a place that's fun, right? People who are young and able expect to go to work in a place which has other young and able people and enjoy themselves. Uh, and, and that's fundamentally gonna draw everyone back, at least to those offices that manage to channel that, and that pleasure. The third way in which it's different is in some sense more, uh, has continuity with the past, but also differences, let's say from the 9-11 shock. Um, always and everywhere, national disasters are mediated by the strength of local institutions, by the strength of civic society, right? A pandemic in Chile, oh, sorry, not a, a, an earthquake in Chile kills many fewer people than an equivalent earthquake in Haiti because of the strength of the Chilean government. Um, now, ask yourself, where are we currently in terms of the government of our cities? We are not, certainly not in the same sort of broad consensus, pragmatic consensus that we were in 2001. Now, I don't think we are in the same place that the Emperor Justinian was in 541 CE, where in some sense, the future of the Mediterranean world hung on the edge of a knife. And indeed, he might have been able to reimpose the Pax Romana on, uh, on Europe, but failed because of the rise of the plague. But we are not perhaps as robust as we were in uh, 1850 or 1860 when we got together and built Central Park to protect us from, from, from uh, cholera. So uh, I think, you know, 
cities are resilient, we will survive this, but we have real challenges. And the most important of those challenges is, as both Jeanette and Richard said, the need to actually form some form of a, a pragmatic consensus that takes care of the new urban crisis that Richard told us about in his, in his last book and actually creates a city with opportunity for all. Mm. Je Jeanette, are you worried about remote work? That was one of the points that Ed just brought up. Are you worried about remote work and how in particular these big cities across the world have seen just, you know, absolutely plummeting levels of ridership for, for transit? Yeah, I mean, I think that this, the telecommuting fever dream that, you know, Ed just mentioned is, you know, definitely overstates the kind of appeal uh, of work from home and underestimates the power of, you know, in person and city living. And, you know, we may be scared of infection, but we didn't stop loving the energy of cities. Um, we didn't stop wanting to eat in great restaurants and drink with friends and go to go to movies. And I think after a year of working at home, my sense is people are going to jump at the chance to trade in their, you know, kitchen office for in-person living pretty quickly. And I think the pandemic has shown us how dull life is without, you know, millions of your best friends. And, you know, I think that uh, mayors are going to be the key to this recovery going forward, and they need to be aggressively advocating for their cities and, and setting the table for growth and transit and mobility improvements and making the case for a city-led uh, in-person recovery, uh, letting private companies know that their, that their city is a safe bet for the future. And I think that there is a lot of opportunity in the way we come back. And maybe some offices are not going to reopen, but those uh, buildings can be repurposed as residential, you know, which is exactly what happened in lower Manhattan after 9-11. And I th also think it's not a bad thing if some job centers relocate. There's no reason why jobs have to be downtown and not closer to home. And I think it would be a step forward if, if more people lived closer to more jobs and, and which in turn would, you know, they would have then the services nearby to sustain them. So Again, I think, you know, with 70 million people filing for unemployment, you know, eight of the 10 top occupations in the nation are in-person jobs, 77 million school kids and college kids in the United States, this let them eat Zoom vibe is just not, I don't think that's the path forward. You know, Michael, I think, I think remote work is sort of important. I won't say it's everything, but I think it's sort of challenging. It creates some opportunities, but some pretty deep challenges. Uh, one, I think it accelerates family formation moves out of cities. I don't think they're about remote work. I think they're still mainly about schools, uh, mainly about schools, not just cost. I think the family formation moves out of cities or mainly schools moves. I think it means cities get younger. The, the people who, who have to go to work because they want to be driven to cities for excitement, but also for work opportunity are young. They're going to need office space. I think there's a big impact on the central business district. I think the central business district will end up being the biggest challenge. I think people will live in cities. It's going to be reshaped. I think the challenge here is on the order of deindustrialization, though not that big. Uh, deindustrialization was a more fundamental challenge uh, because cities lost a lot of that work. I think they're going to lose office work, but say it's 20 or 30 percent. I agree with Ed that it's the advantage that have taken. Uh, the advantage they've taken advantage of remote work, 100%. One thing that I've been puzzling over, though, is a special class of remote workers. Uh, we've seen in recent days a mass migration of the 1% to Miami or Austin. Uh, that's very interesting to me. And the revenue hit, you know, I've read some of the studies that you guys have done, others have done. The revenue hit when high net worth people leave cities in this is, is pretty significant. So I worry that remote work enables you, if you have a business, if you have assets, a real estate development company, a technology-based company, a hedge fund in City X, let's call that city San Francisco or New York. And you say, well, I don't really like paying my personal income tax in that state. I will relocate for tax purposes to a low tax state. I think that is a challenge. And I think the big challenge in remote work will be a challenge to city budgets. Mm -hmm. Uh, Ed, are you worried about that kind of buffet approach to choosing the, the best places? Or is, that, or is that actually something that we had lost as so much op opportunity was kind of concentrated, especially for higher end workers and wealthier individuals and just a handful of superstar cities that maybe getting back to that kind of choice and competition between urban areas maybe is healthy? 
Well, well, you used two of my favorite words right there, and that's exactly how I see it. I, I like both choice and I like competition. Great cities offer offer people's ar archipelagos of neighborhoods that they can choose between. Great countries offer people different places where they can possibly live. That is that is all to the good. Um, that being said, it's going to be a bumpy ride for the next five years for for big dense cities. Um, I think I'm probably less pessimistic about Richard than the downtown in the long run. But there is no doubt that that commercial rents are going to drop and drop significantly in the short run. And that's that's a big that's a big challenge. I think he's exactly right that we should expect to see the older and the wealthy re relocating, uh, especially if there are major tax advantages to do so. It is a very dangerous time for cities to be deciding that they want to run a local uh, welfare state that's going to tax their richest individuals and expect them to pay for every local problem. As much as we want our cities to become places of opportunity that empower everyone, right? we can't expect their near neighbors to pay for all of it. Whatever we think needs to be done has to be shouldered by my society uh, as a whole. So um, I think there's a lot to like about uh, more competition among cities, but we shouldn't sugarcoat it and suggest that it's, that it's going to be easy. But again, I think in the long run, this is not going to be as bad as the 1970s. Uh, and we got through that and uh, we will get through this. Well, uh, I just want to take this moment to remind everybody in the audience to please submit your questions and I'll incorporate them into our discussion uh, we do have a question from Cliff. Does the federal government need to provide massive funds to public transportation for megacities like New York in order to make a comeback? Jeanette, I'll turn to you for that one. There's, there's no question. Uh, you know, New York City is 10% of the nation's GDP. And we need to invest in this infrastructure. When you think about it, it wasn't that long ago that the federal government did an $80 billion bailout to the auto industry. And what we need really is a WPA for the MTA. Um, it is essential. And you know, when people talk about the fact that you know ridership is down, you know, seventy percent on the MTA, and that's true, but there's still 1.7 million people that are taking, you know, the subway every single day, and it's really laid bare just how important that infrastructure really is. So there is absolutely zero question. As goes our transit system, so goes this nation's recovery. Transit recovery is national recovery. And there is no doubt about that. And I'm, I think we're very fortunate to have President-elect Biden there who understands the importance of building it back and building it back greener and building it back stronger. And transit is at the heart of that program. You know, I think, I think a big question here, Michael, and I don't have the answer for this, is there's going to have to be bailouts. Um, there was recently at least um, a, a transit bailout. New York allegedly didn't get enough. And there's gonna have to be local bailouts. Although it was interesting that California is running a surplus. I just found that interesting and maybe Ed can reflect on that. There's gonna have to be local bailouts. And the question I would ask, and I don't have an answer for this is how much do you just hand over money and say, look, it's a tough time for transit and transport and for cities. This is essentially a bridge loan. It's not gonna go on forever. We're gonna need it for a year or two. And how much do you add in uh, certain considerations? You would like local government to be more effective, less duplicative, be run on a metropolitan-wide basis, transit authorities to work better with one another. I don't know the answer to that, but it seems to me there's going to have to be help from the federal government. And the real question is, do you just hand over cash or do you try to use that as a way to make local areas better govern themselves? Ed, feel free to respond to that. I'm, I'm not sure I have any great uh, understanding of the the, the California the California <laughs> bonanza I, I think it has something to do with capital gains uh, taxes in California but I, I really I really don't know it's sort of an amazing and, and surprising thing I, I think I think Richard is is right uh, and I think in some sense uh, Jeanette is right although I am in general much more skeptical about the federal government bailing out local governments and I am a longtime skeptic of federal subsidies for mobility uh, I am, I am more comfortable with the idea of subsidizing mobility for the poor than I am for subsidizing mobility for the rich. Uh, and consequently, I, I certainly see some part of that argument. But it is hard to think of an area in which it is easier to waste billions and billions of dollars than subsidizing a people mover monorail in, in Detroit. Uh, and I think that every major investment of every form needs to be subjected to rigorous cost benefit analysis where we can feel confident about that. In some sense, the way I think about the, the city level bailouts, and, and I want to move away from transportation here because that's going to get too personal with Jeanette and she's going to hit me via Zoom. I'm over, over, just about if to. I do anything. <laughs> um, but I, ideally, cities, you know, uh, 
should not be in the business of of you know being being bailed out by the federal government and should save in, in rich years and and borrow in lean years and they should take care of their own things for some strange reason in the political economy of the united states we have reached a, a world in which we are very comfortable with the federal government borrowing trillions trillions for whatever whatever reason without any worry whatsoever right whereas the idea that a city government is going to run a deficit all of a sudden gets treated as being a a, a terrible possibility uh, that's just nonsense, right? Um, we do want, you know, good checks on, on local fiscal responsibility, but it really is okay to borrow during during a downturn. And it really is okay, and I'll, I'll take an example in terms of, of a policy in which I probably would have voted for it, but I would have voted uh, holding my nose, uh, mm -hmm. is the incredible amount of money that went into the Paycheck Protection Program. I mean, uh, at $650 billion targeted by the banking industry, right, to uh, the early round went disproportionately to the firms that hadn't been negative in, in impact by COVID rather than those firms that had. The early round went to firms that had more of a line of credit rather than those with less of a line of credit, right? Unsurprisingly, that's what happens when you rush that kind of aid, aid out quickly. And yet still the level of suffering is so enormous that it had to happen. And so uh, I think the same thing that Richard does that, you know, at least some kind of short term uh, bridge support needs to be there. And Ed, real quick to you, and then I'll get to you, Jeanette. Ed, is, do you see any backlash with people saying, why should poor cities and states pay for New York City, pay for California? What, what's for sure. your response to that charge? For sure. That is, that is the, I mean, you know, it is a constant reason why, why we think that redistribution across space is dangerous at best. I think whatever happens for cities is going to be built into a national, into a national program. So you hope for some form of spatial balance between different areas uh, and cities get help for transportation, just as poor areas get different forms of assistance. Jeanette, I want to give you a chance to respond to the <laughs> transportation question, but actually you use this as a chance to pivot to another line of questioning on where we see the winners and losers from, you know, in mega cities over the past year or so, um, not just of cities themselves who are the winners and losers, but within cities, it seems like one of the winners was outdoor dining, open streets, uh, biking. You know, these are all things that you've fought for. That seems like a great lesson that we can take away from this. What, what, what are your thoughts on some of the other winners and losers from this past year in mega cities? Yeah, sure. Uh, first of all, I would just offer back to Ed, whose work I am just a complete disciple of. Um, but I would just add that we have no problem subsidizing roads and interstate highways and all the rest. It's always interesting to see when the cost benefit analysis comes down. And that cost benefit analysis is somebody that worked at USDOT is uh, slightly flawed, uh, to be sure. But we're, we're talking about investments that again, to the point of why should people want to support uh, New York City and the transit system there, not only are jobs created in all 50 states from producing the equipment that goes into building the New York City subway system and maintaining it, but also, again, 10% of the nation's GDP comes from this city. So there's a good national argument for it. And I agree with Ed that we need to actually start to have a national vision to, that has outcomes and metrics and data that we can look at to see how, what the results are, how these investments are performing, to just keep throwing money after, you know, dollar after dollar without expecting a different kind of return or a different kind of outcome is insane. Um, I do think- Can that I just, can I just respond quickly? Just, just, I want to, I want to make it clear. Yeah. I will yield to no one, yield to no one in my willingness to denigrate subsidies to transportation in low density areas. I will yield to no one in my unhappiness about subsidizing roads to roads to nowhere. Um, I, I do not believe that a bad subsidy in one area generates a, a case for a bad subsidy in another area, but certainly I, I'm 100% behind Jeanette in, in wanting to question those, those kinds of policies. And secondly, I will also yield to no one in my belief and support for the city of New York. And so I'm very grateful that Jeanette has done that her entire life, and I'm glad to be part of her fan, fan uh, club as part of that. I think we're all fans here. <laughs> I'm going to write that down. That makes me really happy. Um, I think what we've seen, you know, in 2020 is just the beginning. I think, you know, to say like, you know, what are the lessons learned? I think, you know, we're not handing out gold medals yet. There's a long way to go, but I think there are some cities that have actually done it really, really well. And you start to see to a certain degree, it's like how they've handled the COVID crisis. Hong Kong comes to the top of the list, you know, one of the most dense cities yet it only had 118 COVID cases, which is amazing. You know, um, Kansas had a fraction of that, you know, population and has, something like almost 20 times the number of deaths. So I think that's extraordinary. But, you know, the pandemic, I think, also changed expectations um, about what was possible at scale, you know, and at a pace that we've never seen before. You know, you sort of saw the empty streets, which showed, I think, what the possibilities were for bringing different activities to the streets. You know, in New York City alone, 
there have been over 10,000 restaurants that have been certified for outdoor dining, uh, taking up 15,000 parking spaces. If I had taken 15,000 parking spaces away, you know, I would not have been sitting here with this uh, esteemed crew today. Um, and I think that, you know, you take a look at European cities also, they've built 650 miles of bike lanes and, and slow speed zones and pedestrian zones. And I think the goal, which is important, is not to reset cities back to February, you know, 2020. I think we've got a once in a lifetime opportunity to, to correct for the sins of 20, 20th century planning, you know, and, and orient away from, from cars and toward people. And I think it would be a historic blunder, you know, that Ed can then document, you know, if we um, allow these changes over the, you know, last nine months to, you know, go back to where we were before. And when you think about it, in a lot of 20th century planning, we plan cities around the car and the separation of uses. You know, you live one place, you work, you know, in another neighborhood, you know, and you travel to a different place to, to eat. And this kind of planning um, brought, you know, really was the kind of kindling for the traffic crisis that we have today. It's just this whole, you know, different way instead of, and I think you're starting to see some interest in 15 minute neighborhoods where, you know, all of the activities are in, you know, a walkable, you know, bikeable distance. And so I think that that's gonna be, uh, that's, that's what, what you're starting to see in cities from, you know, what Milan is doing with the bike lanes, what Paris is doing on the Rue de Rivoli, you know, all of the Bogota, you know, even cities like Chicago and, you know, all over the, over the world, you're seeing the, these restaurant streets. And um, again, I, I don't think that that would have been possible, but for this moment, and I think it's, it's, it's very exciting to see, you know, the possibilities that have been hidden in plain sight. Michael, you asked about winners and losers. Let me, let me try my hand. I think the winner at the individual level and the city level will be talent. And uh, let me piggyback on Ed and call it the, the rise of the consumer creative city. That I think coming out of this, cities will be incredibly attractive places for the advantage, the affluent and the talented. That, that with regard to attracting them, but also when I talk to leading office designers and architects, what they are thinking has to be done to get people back to the office. It's no longer the office as workspace. It's the office. When they say offices, when I say office as experience, it is everything you can imagine and more. So I think the ability to attract talent, that doesn't just mean big cities, uh, small cities, smaller cities like Austin have done a very good job, Boulder, Colorado. And, but I think the losers are going to be those with less education and less skill. And I think we're going to have this ever widening gap between individuals and places, unless, unless we figure out at the local level and, and as Ed said, at the federal level, because this is a big thing, how to make our society more equal and, and have more opportunity. But if not, the winners are going to be the advantaged and the talented and the losers are going to be those who aren't. Ed, do you find a difference between how developed mega cities have dealt with this versus developing. Um, you've, you've followed closely big, large cities in Africa for many years now, for instance. Um, and I know you've, you've traveled the world. How have you seen cities like New York differ in how, or London or Paris in their 15 minute city differ from what you've seen in other parts of the world with other global mega cities? Well, developing world mega cities are like rich world mega cities, only more so. Um, so uh, in Africa, there were lockdowns that immediately were more extreme than anything we had in the West. So uh, a city like Kampala shuts down completely. You, you, you're having a baby, you're not allowed to go to the hospital. You're, you're, you know, you're desperate for something, you can't get out. You're, you're just being locked down. It was clear in the first weeks of the pandemic that many more people were dying from the lockdowns that were dying from COVID-19. Uh, it isn't quite clear how the disease has spread outside of South Africa. We don't, we don't really know outside of, of South Africa, which is, which is better measured. South Africa itself has seen economic carnage for uh, its, its poor uh, citizens. That is worse than anything we've seen in the United States. So, you know, the poor South Africans still depend upon the urban service economy and that was still massively disrupted. Um, the view from India suggests that, and this, there's really remarkable work that Anup Malani at the University of Chicago and his co-authors have done doing serological work in Indian slums. Um, and he found even in July that, that more than 50% of the residents of Mumbai slums already had COVID-19 antibodies, right? So it essentially suggests that these slums might have reached herd immunity. 
Um, whereas in the richer parts of, of Mumbai, 16% of the population appear to have been exposed to the disease. So huge inequities on this, but also that uh, Indian cities may have gotten past it already, or at least in the poorest, most dense, most crowded uh, parts of them. Um, and done so with relatively moderate uh, death, death rates, um, probably because they're younger and they have much lower obesity rates. Um, finally, uh, I mean, you know, if, if, you're, if you're too poor, you tend, not to be, uh, you tend not to be able to eat that much. Finally, of course, Latin America has been extraordinary. Uh, uh, these, these have been you know, countries in which the COVID death, rate, death toll has been just enormous. Um, they've also had lockdowns like the US, but they've been only sporadically impactful. Um, it's not that the Brazilians didn't lock themselves down. They did. Uh, they did, in fact, in many cases, more than the United States did, partially because it's winter down there during the summer rather than summer. summer. Um, but uh, they didn't follow the rules at all. So the rules were roughly irrelevant. People just seemed to have, have, have locked down whenever they, they were frightened. And I think that's a, that's a lesson for us as well. We often had this debate as if, oh, we're trading off the economy with safety and lockdown. Look, the businesses weren't going to come back as long as people were terrified of the disease. It didn't, it didn't matter what the actual rules, rules were. Um, but there's no question in the longer run that, that if, if we are confident that the pandemic is not going to stem the growth of rich world mega megacities, it is going to do even less to the trajectory of poor world megacities, right? I mean, these places are as poor as American cities were in the 19th century, and New York grew despite yellow fever, despite cholera death rates that were much higher than the death rates, death rates today. And that is sure to continue in the great growing cities of the developing world that are really our best paths out of poverty into prosperity for those places. Richard, I see you nodding. Uh, feel free to I comment. Agree. I, I was just going to make the point, Ned made it, that I think we talk about the death of cities in the advanced world, particularly the United States, where New York, as Jeanette said, makes up 10% of GDP. <laughs> you look at some of these cities in the developing world, they account for a much a greater share of GDP, and no one's talking about them dying off. In fact, most people see them as, as growing. I think one there's one interesting point. I think the, th the reason the mega cities got hit hard doesn't really have as much to do with density than to the fact that people just travel a lot between them, that these are places that are very globally connected and they got hit first. They got hit when we knew the least. And uh, with my colleague, Charlotte Melander, we did a little exercise looking at Sweden. Now, now it, but, but Sweden, which didn't have any real lockdowns and regional differentiation. And when we looked at the data pretty closely, because the Swedes, one thing they have is good data, we found random variation. We could find nothing that accounted for the spread of this disease across Sweden, other, you know, there were some very small scale correlations, uh, but it was random. So I think that's very interesting to me that there's nothing that we can quite pinpoint other than the global connectivity of these places that look like key factors in its spread. And, and maybe Ed or Jeanette have something else to add on that, but that's, that's what we found. Oh, that sounds right. I mean, cities are the nodes of the transportation network that link our world. And so they are the first places that get hit. But, you know, as we've seen in the Dakotas, right, it's perfectly possible for this disease to, to decimate uh, some of the lowest density parts of America. I want to make one minor point, which, which keys off of, of Richard's point about uh, Sweden. One of the ways that we argue that lockdown policies are just not that important for the economic consequences of the plague is the comparison that one very nice paper did between Sweden and Denmark. That in fact, the economic changes between the, the Swedes and the Danes, even though Denmark had a full European lockdown and Sweden, Sweden had none, are identical. There was virtually no difference between the two populations because the Swedes had actually cut back their spending without the formal lock lockdown and the Danes had, had shut it down with it. Is the pandemic the real challenge to megacities or is it the second order effects from the pandemic, right? The effects on finances, transit, and the like. It seems like we've always been able to deal with pandemics, uh, but it's how we lead our way through it that seems to matter. Is that is that right? Um, I think, Michael, just Richard? to be quick about this, I think the pandemic is an accelerator of trends already underway, that, that it accelerated family formation moves and compressed them, it accelerated the shift to remote work and other forms of remote, but it's, it's not a fundamental disruptor. One thing that I will, will, will just throw in that I find so interesting and Ed was talking about lockdown versus no lockdown. What's so interesting to me is that there's been a continued migration talked about in the media in the United States from the places that have arguably been most effective at mitigating the disease after they were hit. Let's say San Francisco and New York that did very well uh, from a public health point of view to places that have been far less effective uh, to Texas and Florida. So when it comes down to people's mobility, I find this very interesting. Uh, 
uh, when it comes down to people's mobility, people are discounting the pandemic, it seems to me, in their own locational choices. And I just find that fascinating. You know, okay, I have a family. I'm thinking about a move. Let me move from a place I'm relatively safe in public health terms. Now, I understand why that is. I have a perception that it's warmer. I have more open space. I have a backyard. I understand the motivate. I can depend on a car versus transit. I understand the human psychology, which is just very interesting to me in the midst of a pandemic. It seems to me people have discounted at least if I believe the trend lines, they're discounted their own health in, in their migration decisions. So that suggests to me that this is an accelerator, not a disruptor. And, and Jeanette, I also find it interesting that uh, while people aren't writing transit during this crisis, if you look at recent transit referenda, people are voting for transit, right? I mean, Austin's a great example of that. Yeah, I think that's right. And, you know, the, the other thing that I think is important is, you know, people, you say people aren't riding transit, you know, people are still riding transit, you know, New York City, you still have 1.7 million people a day riding transit, you have that in all the big cities. I think one of the things that we haven't really talked about um, is that the pandemic has really laid bare some of the structural inequities and racism that has long existed in our cities. And we've already known for a very long time that where you live in cities is closely correlated with income and health and access to jobs and schools and, and um, opportunities for economic mobility. And I think that this same map of inequality now shows the ravages of the virus. You know, Blacks and Latinos have been disproportionately impacted by this pandemic and they've got more cases and more deaths. And at the same time, non-white populations are much more likely to be essential workers who, you know, work through this crisis and, and had greater dependence on public transportation. And this, I think this dependence is just a more visible demonstration of something that was visible before the pandemic. And, you know, APTA uh, estimates, the American Public Transit Association estimates that 60% of transit trips are taken by people of color with lower incomes and with fewer transportation choices who can't afford the $9,300 that it costs to own, operate and maintain a car annually. So I think when we're talking about cities, it's important to look at that you know, and look at the equitable nature of cities, you know, because an equitable city is not where, you know, you just, where everyone's wealthy enough to have a car. I think it was Enrique Peñaloso said that, you know, a good city is one where even the wealthy use public transportation. And, you know, we've always depended on essential workers. And I think the pandemic shows that we need to build more strengths into our cities for just economic recovery to create more equitable and accessible and sustainable cities for years to come. And I agree with Richard that this is an accelerator toward that end. Ed, you co-authored a paper on this, I believe, showing how uh, essential workers, uh, minority residents of New York City, poor residents did suffer more. I mean, we all know this, but you showed how they've been suffering more during this pandemic, is that, is that Absolutely. right? Absolutely, it's, it's a very strong prediction of how often you leave your leave your house to go to work uh, or to get essential supplies. And, you know, it's a very strong predictor of getting COVID cases. You know, using that, very, the variation that comes from working in essential industries, we found that a 10% reduction in trips in New York in March and April was associated with a 20% reduction in COVID cases. So uh, Jeanette couldn't be uh, more right on, the, on this. Um, and I agree also uh, with Richard that, that in some sense it is, it is an accelerator. There are our cities have always been places of inequality, right? I mean, it, it was Plato who wrote in the Republic that every city of whatever size is in reality two cities, one a city of the rich and the other a city of the poor, and they are perpetually at war with one another. Um, and cities have to be able to tolerate those inequalities, but they only should tolerate them if cities are performing their historic job of turning poor people into rich people. And that is really the crucial thing that cities have been failing on. That's one of the things that comes out of the Opportunity Insights Atlas data of Raj Chetty and, and his co-authors is that big cities and big city school districts have not been succeeding in enabling people to move up uh, the earnings elevator. And we really have to, to reimagine cities for outsiders, cities for people who start with less, cities for people who don't have to cars in, in their uh, garage in a large suburban home. Um, but we also need to be smart about it. And that's, that's why, you know, I, I, you know, I get wonkish on cost benefit analysis. We need to make sure if, you know, this form of transportation investment is the right thing to do relative to investing in more pre-K programs, right? We need to make sure that we thought through everything that what we're doing. And we need to be smart about things like uh, racism and policing, right? The view that simply says we are going to defund the police right, uh, for all the, the horrors of the murder of George Floyd, that feels like it does an injustice to every African-American child who walks home in fear 
uh, from her school, right? That is a civil rights issue just as much as an African-American boy who is being abused by the, by the police are. And we need to have police that are more accountable. We need to have police who are better monitored, who wear body cameras, who have, who have strong incentives within the system to respond to their community. I, I join strongly with those people who want, who want those things um, and who have a different vision of policing that's not just about locking people up. But that must coexist with safety. That must coexist with people actually being able to walk our streets and taking advantage of it. Everything else that we're talking about depends upon the ability to move around this, the city without looking over your shoulder in fear. And that requires police that are better, not worse. That police requires police that are humane. And that almost assuredly requires more, not less funding of the police. So I, I, think, I think the accelerant to build on what Ed and Jeanette said is going to make cities more unequal, not less. And I think one thing that is almost for sure is cities are going to get younger and poorer. That that those who the people leaving, if we've seen in every analysis, are the affluent and the educated. Um, and I think in the U.S., Ed said this very early on. We have loaded a lot of our social welfare system onto the backs of cities, and that's why they're expensive, and that's why they have higher tax burdens. Uh, affluent people have often been able to, for a long time, escape to the suburbs, vote with their feet. So I, I, I think now's a time that if we really want to address this, and, and at, at the same time that our media is gleefully cheering on the death of cities, the death of New York, the death of San Francisco, you know, that, that death, if, if there, there isn't going to be the death, but the pr challenges of those cities are not going to principally hit uh, high net worth people, billionaires, oligarchs, even the owners of, owners of real estate, although some of those will be challenged. They're going to fall fundamentally on the least advantaged parts of the city on the least advantaged people. And therein lies the rub, you know, if cities empty or what, what part of them is empty, it has been the most affluent, the most advantaged, the people who pay the most taxes. So there, I, I think there is a, a necessity, an obligation to rebuild our cities with the focus on equity. And that's, that burden should not just fall on cities themselves. For some of those social obligations, it's gonna require federal spending. Richard, can, can we rebuild with equity without addressing the housing barriers? That are I was going to say two things. Cities. Sorry, Michael. I was anticipating. I think we have to work on both the demand and the supply side. Um, so let me say first, what I'm worries me, what keeps me up at night, is the throwing the baby out with the bathwater. We've reached such an equity or distributional crisis in American cities that we want to run out all the tech companies and the techies and the innovation because they're part of the problem. Boy, oh boy, if if that becomes the case, either through regulation or redistribution or whatever aggressiveness, we have a real disaster on our hand. I think obviously the housing issue is a big part of it and, and not only adding to supply, we could argue this forever, but focusing on affordable supply, affordable rental, adding to supply, but I think we've added some supply now with the crisis. But I also think we have to figure out a way to take those 40 or 50% of just horrifically low paying jobs and figure out a way to add productivity and capability and skill and creativity and, and, and on, on that side, improve the wages. I don't think we have to make wages, but I think we have to figure out a way to get people a more decent way so they can afford better housing and create cities of opportunity again. So yeah, I think it's all part of a rub, but I worry, I worry that we're in an innovations versus equality or productivity versus equality. And I think if we get there, if that's where we're at, we're in a difficult time. And Ed, you've, you've written before on newcomers versus entrenched, insiders versus outsiders as part of that housing dynamic, but also it's not just housing, it's entrepreneurship, it's labor, it's education, it's a whole host of issues that present part of that growth and inequality challenge that I think Richard was talking about and you kind of alluded to earlier, right? Absolutely. I mean, I, I think America over the last 50 years has moved in a way that has increasingly protected the entrenched, protected the old, uh, protected the wealthy, and left the, the newcomers out in the cold. Um, unfortunately, this creates a dynamic in which um, you know, the, the young see uh, a, a government, a federal government that looks like a pension system with an army, and they say, I want mine, forgive my student debt, right? That's, that's, that's the trade-off. That's not a sensible way to make policy, right? We may want to, to reform Medicare. We may want to make sure that we're, we're paying less, but we want whatever policies we're throwing to the young to empower them, to make them as productive as possible, right? We want to think about, you know, how to make education for the poorest urbanites more effective and, and, and more successful in generating new entrepreneurship. We want to make sure that we've thought about every urban regulation that both prevents housing and that prevents new entrepreneurship. We want to make sure that all of those regulations are rethought and made as seamless as possible. There's no reason why we shouldn't have cost-benefit analysis for all of them as well. Uh, and 
particularly given that COVID-19 has been associated with a small business apocalypse in terms of, of urban small businesses going under, right? We need those businesses to be able to reopen. We can't save them all. And consequently, it's a great time to think about reforming our, our business permitting system. It is an outrage in this country that we regulate the entrepreneurship of the poor so much more that we regulate the entrepreneurship of the rich. It is much easier to start your internet phenom in a Harvard College dorm than it is to start a, a grocery store that sells milk products four blocks away. Uh, that's an infamy, right? We, we really do need to make sure that our new businesses can open and that every New Yorker with a dream and a little bit of financial backing can start their business, which can employ and, and entertain uh, the city around them. You know, it, we, we do talk about income inequality, but I do appreciate, Ed, your point on regulatory inequality. That's a, that's a really good one. And Jeanette, you know, it, it seems like uh, uh, if, if, as Alain Berteau said, cities are labor markets, that your ability to actually get from where you live to a job is crucial. And, you know, if, if housing is unaffordable, you have to move further and further out, and then transportation is underfunded or, or late, perpetually late or fares are going up, but the ability for cities to essentially function, which is basically function, uh, goes out the window and the jobs housing and transportation, that kind of trifecta just begins to fall apart. I mean, transportation is absolutely crucial to this too, right? Yeah. Well, I mean, I'm going to be the first one to say that, you know, it's all about transportation. Um, <laughs> and I think that transportation and housing are two sides of the same coin. You know, density is destiny in, in cities and we need to get that right. And we can get that right also at the federal level when we condition you know, transportation funding and housing funding on proximity and a variety of other criteria that could actually make sure that we're getting the outcomes that we want, not just, you know, random funding streams that don't tie together with a cohesive strategy. But I think that it's, it's you know, transit is going to play a huge role in the future of cities. I don't think we can get away from that. And I appreciate, you know, the comments about technology, but, you know, technology wasn't, you know, didn't come to the rescue here, you know, in the pandemic. You know, for the last five years, we've been talking a lot about, you know, the tech driven future and flying cars and driverless cars and all the rest. And I think that's, you know, that's, I'm supportive of innovation, but I think we can't, you know, we tend to look at it as a panacea and like everything's just going to get better if we just have the flying cars. And, you know, transit and active mobility were the pieces that came together to, to you know, address the issues that we were facing in this pandemic. You know, the first thing that Uber and Lyft did was to cut back staff and operations and, you know, scooters pulled up overnight. So I think the idea of a smart city and the future of the city is not where it's not uh, using tech to reduce car traffic. It's it's building a city where you don't need to have a car in the first place. And I think that going back to that transit investment is extremely important and the pandemic you know, we talked about this, you know, Richard and, and Ed talked about this, it hit different neighborhoods differently because, you know, cities have been built to out of state standards, you know, and people have to travel long distances to, to jobs and services. And, you know, the workers are essential workers are vulnerable and they are at risk, you know, of imperiling both their health as, as Ed pointed out and also vulnerable to service cuts in, in buses and trains. And that's gonna have a huge impact on their um, ability to access the opportunity that, that Ed just pointed out. You know, one, one opportunity coming out of this pandemic probably is to get a handle on transit, transport, car driving and congestion. Uh, and I'm a big believer in congestion pricing, but, but if, you, if you really did a short list of why people are leaving a place like New York, uh, one is, and it's not the, I saw this thing today where they said the cost of housing in New York is $2.2 million. No, that's the cost of housing in Manhattan. The cost of housing in the New York Metro is, is not horrendously out of line, horrendously out of line with other, it's not San Francisco. Um, the second one is schools. And the third one is heinous commutes. People, you know, when, when I talk to people who've left New York, heinous, when New York metropolitan area, heinous commutes, congestion, traffic, I don't like the subway. So here we have an opportunity, I think, to rethink uh, our commutes, to potentially use remote technology to reduce commutes. Uh, not everyone's going to remote, go remote all the time, but what if people go remote a day or two a week, like often professors work remotely a day or two a week. Um, I think you can reduce the burden not only in car, but to reduce the burden on transit and make the, the commuting experience better. So I think 
that, that rethinking the way we get around cities. And Jeanette, one of the things I applaud that you've done is before it was a car or a subway. Now we have different options. Uh, we can take a bike, we can take a scooter, micro mobility. Uh, and I think we've seen a real surge in these other mobility options. So thinking about this, how we reduce congestion and traffic congestion and all of those issues, I think we have a real opportunity coming out of the pandemic. And you know, the best way to get around a city is still walking. And Jeanette has been yep. just a hero in making New York more walking, walking friendly. But yeah, hundred percent. What, what's, uh, what's your take, Richard, on uh, Jeanette's thoughts on smart cities? I mean, I mean it, maybe, maybe thought narrowly smart cities did not necessarily save us from this pandemic, but maybe thought, thought of broadly in terms of new autonomous solutions or new ways to get around that maybe maybe smart cities uh, were or will be or have been part of the solution. What's your take on well, you know, the future of smart cities coming out of this? When we looked at this before the pandemic and, and categorized something we called urban tech, which is smart city centers, construction technology, property technology, mobility technology, and a few other things, we found that it was the single largest area of venture capital investment, larger than biotech, larger than artificial intelligence. So to our mind, that was a pretty big deal. Um, you know, and I think that many of the concerns about this going into the pandemic that were privacy related will, will lessen. You know, it was Ezra Klein who said, if I was worried about privacy before, you know, if, if giving up my data enables me to keep my mother or ailing grandmother alive, well, so do it, I'll give up my privacy and my data. Um, and, and so I think that the medical technology and the use of data will lessen these concerns. And I think technology will ever more interpenetrate our lives. I think the real question, and Jeanette would know better than I because she certain is governance. Uh, what I saw happen in Toronto with the sidewalk labs in Berlio was not a question so much, it was the inability of Toronto to have the governance mechanisms that knew what to do with that thing and, and just fumble the ball. So I think creating governance mechanisms that can deal with technology in the city and the use of, of new technology to reshape the city it operates, that's really the challenge. And Ed, this really does seem like a key takeaway is the importance of leadership and governance. Uh, whatever we're talking about with the pandemic or transit or finances or, or equity, leadership and governance seems to be the key here. Uh, what would you tell to leaders of global megacities of what lessons they should take away and how they should, uh, to quote uh, others, to build back better coming out of this? <laughs> You know, I, I agree completely with that, and uh, that that the, that the central need is for capable, pragmatic leadership going forward. Um, I, I do believe that the largest risks are the collateral damage, um, but of course, that's assuming that we don't have a second pandemic in two years, right? So there is, in fact, need for leadership at the national level to make sure that this never happens again. But if it doesn't, right, cities will get back, but the collateral damage is is real. The economic dislocation. Uh, the, the, the human misery, the fiscal chaos, the difficulty of getting people back on, on the trains, uh, all of these things are enormous. And don't forget, right, even with a vaccine, it's going to be a while until global uh, travel rises to its former levels, right? We're going to have many months, if not years, until cities get back their tourist industry. So we've got real challenges. Now, what do we think are the most, most important lessons for leadership on this? Uh, I think it's recognizing that we're all in this together recognizing that a plague that starts in China can uh, afflict the Upper East Side. Um, and that requires more of a commitment to sort of global health and to global monitoring systems. But we're also all in it together in the city, right? That in fact, the great infrastructure of the 19th century, the aqueduct, the sewers were built partially because the residents of townhouses on Washington Square recognized that they could get cholera from someone who lived on, on the Bowery. And that sense of a common connection is absolutely vital. But at the same time, we have to be ruthlessly pragmatic about how we deliver services for each other. This is not a time to spiral off into the dreams of a, of a Lindsay-esque uh, uh, vision of, the, of a city that knows no boundaries. Cities face limits today. They face exactly what Richard has been talking about, that their rich can leave quite easily. And we are at an unstable moment. And it is an absolutely crucial moment that everyone who cares about the city bring as much as they can to smart reasoning, to data, to learning, right, in order to, to actually figure out what's uh, what the right path forward is. And I want to I just end with just one comment about, in some sense, the most important step in dealing with COVID lockdowns was that taken in New Zealand, which was measuring the presence of the disease in the AIDS symptomatic. 
they didn't reopen on a hope. They reopened when you know random sampling of the population showed the disease had, had ended, right? That is about humility. That is about learning. That is about recognizing that you, you don't know the answers going in. Um, and that's absolutely crucial going forward. We don't know all the answers on how to make our cities more, more equitable, more places of opportunity. And we've got to turn them into learning machines. Mm. Jeanette, uh, there's nothing that reminds me that we're all in together, uh, all in this together, like Ed just said, than riding on a subway car. Uh, what are your lessons to, uh, to urban leaders coming out of this crisis? Well, I agree completely with what Ed said. And it is, you know, it's about vision and it's about leadership and it's about accountability, you know, setting a vision for what you want to accomplish, you know, showing what's possible, building the, you know, messaging around what it is that we're going to accomplish together and then, you know, getting it done. I think that, you know, I, I've said this earlier, but I think that the winners of this post-vaccine era are, are, are those cities that can adapt to the new realities that we face without going back to the old status quo approaches to things. And so that they don't just go back to where they were before. And I think, you know, transit is obviously going to play a huge role and we are all in that together. Nothing says all in together than, you know, 5.5 million New Yorkers, you know, jammed together on subways and enjoying one another's company. Uh, that's a future, you know, uh, scenario that I'm looking forward to. But, you know, people move to cities because they like cities, you know, that is what it's about. And, you know, I think, you know, our future as a planet is going to be about cities. That's where the population's moving. Um, we have over half, you know, the world's population living in cities now. And so transit's key, leadership is key, data is key. And, you know, I do think that uh, a worst case scenario coming out of this is adding a traffic and transportation crisis to the health and economic crisis. That would be a disaster. I've already it looks like told we're going to have Secretary Buttigieg, who's <laughs> going to help us build it back better, which I think is an exciting development. Um, but cities are not going to recover if, um, with you know, the unemployment levels that we haven't seen since the Great Depression, you know, unless they can get to work quickly and dependably and, and have lots of options for getting there. And you know, no one in cities is going to be able to get to jobs if everyone drives. And so, going back to those strategies that worked you know, before the pandemic in terms of walking and biking uh, and transit, those, those are the same success stories that were, and the same investments that we need to, to make, you know, in the years to come. I've already said Richard? I'm a glass half full person. So let me give you a wild and an optimistic projection, a hypothesis about what could happen. Um, the US government has so badly bungled its handling of this pandemic, but you look at the news of the day this incredible public-private partnership, private sector-led effort to build a vaccine in under a year. If people had told me this in March, I would have said you're from the moon, it's impossible. The fact that these people could design this vaccine in a weekend before we even knew a pandemic. The innovative capability, and, and I wanna come back to this idea of public-private partnership. The US has pioneered at the local level this very unique public-private partnership model. Yes, it works in New York, but when I lived in Pittsburgh, I saw it rebuild Pittsburgh. You look at Detroit, you look at Buffalo, you look at Milwaukee, Indianapolis, Philadelphia. And maybe it may just be that some of our big cities are stymied. There are so many uh, contestants and claimants. But boy, oh boy, you go out to the heartland. You go out to the Tulsas of the world, the Columbuses of the world. The, the, one, of, one of my friends called them the grateful cities. I, I just laughed when he said the grateful cities. I think this ability to put real estate and technology and community concerns and the actions of universities and medical centers together in all of these various different ways, it happens in the U.S. in a chaotic way in an unregulated way, in a way that it, it, it's often just crazy, but it happens. I could see these things exploding. Like I could see this accelerant. People saying, you know, we built a vaccine. We can rebuild our cities. I think the big challenge, Michael, is equity. How do we make sure that the least advantage of us are part of that? But I, I think this idea of public-private that the US does better than anywhere else, this could be something that is unleashed in a way we haven't seen before. That's an optimistic projection, but, but a hopeful one. Richard, Jeanette, Ed, thank you so much for joining us for this conversation. And to all of us from the, and from all of us at the Manhattan Institute, thank you to everyone joining in. Thank you, Michael. Thank you, Mike.